Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisteredNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over respiratory alkalosis. Right now I'm doing a series on acid and base imbalances, so if you're studying this in school be sure to check out those videos. Now in the previous video I went over respiratory acidosis because there are some differences in these two conditions. So in this video what I'm going to do for you is I want to highlight the things you need to know for NCLEX and for your nursing lecture exam. So I'm going to be going over the key concepts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify the patho because if you can understand the pathophysiology you can understand the causes and why the patient has those signs and symptoms and what are the nursing interventions for the patient. Why are you doing those? It all make sense. Then I'm going to follow it up and work a arterial blood gas problem for you with a patient who is in respiratory alkalosis and show you how to set it up and I'm going to use the tic-tac-toe method. Now after this video be sure to go to my website registerednursern.com and take the free quiz that's going to test your knowledge on respiratory alkalosis and respiratory acidosis. A card should be popping up or a link in the description below so you can get that free quiz. Okay, first let's look at the pathophysiology of this and simplify it. Okay, whenever you have respiratory alkalosis, the problem is in the lungs, specifically in these little alveolar sacs. But first let's talk about what's going on when you're breathing in air and expelling air. Okay, what happens is that you take oxygen in through your nose or in through your mouth and it travels down to your pharynx then down through your larynx, which is your throat, then down through the trachea, which, which branches off into the bronchus, your right and left bronchus, then that branches off into your bronchioles, and then that branches off into your alveolar sacs. Now in that sac is where gas exchange is happening. So you just took in all this fresh, fresh oxygen, and that's gonna go across that sac and attach to a red blood cell, which the red blood cell is going to transport it through your body and supply your muscles, your tissues, all that with that nice oxygen. But your body is trying to get rid of the carbon dioxide that's built up in its body. So the carbon dioxide will go across that alveolar sac's membrane and it will travel the opposite direction of what oxygen did and you will expel it out through your nose and through your mouth. Now, a normal adult breathes 12 to 20 beats per minute, and I mean breaths per minute, and that is a good amount of breathing to get rid of this oxygen, I mean this carbon dioxide. So anytime you have something that's messing with how much you're breathing or anything like that, it's going to affect how much carbon dioxide you are getting rid of. So here, these are key concepts you want to remember you are expelling way too much carbon dioxide. And you're doing this due to tachypenia. Tachy means fast, penia deals with respirations. And you're probably breathing more than 20 breaths per minute. So you're just going <sighs> hyperventilating. And what you're doing is you are just pushing all that carbon dioxide out. And your body does not like that. So whenever you're getting rid of all that carbon dioxide, what happens is that your pH in your blood starts to increase. You're starting to make your blood alkalotic, basic. And any value greater than 7.45 is alkalotic. But your PaCO2, which measures your carbon dioxide levels, start to decrease. And the reason they're decreasing is because you're blowing it all, all out of your lungs. It's going away. So the level will be less than 35. Now, the body doesn't like this. And remember, as we always talk about, the body loves to be in a homeostatic environment. It likes everything to be normal. So it will try to use other organs of the body to help fix problems that's going on. So the kidneys start to play a role in this. And what the kidneys will do to try to compensate is that it will cause the kidneys to start getting rid of all this bicarbonate, to, to just flush it out of the body. So you're going to be urinating all this bicarbonate out, which is HCO3. And the body hopes by doing this, it will decrease that pH, which is alkalotic right now, because remember your pH is high, it wants to get it down. So it thinks by getting rid of all that bicarbonate, it will help do that. 
So you want to memorize these lab values. Commit these to memory because whenever in nursing school they love to give you blood gas analysis problems and ask you is this respiratory alkalosis, acidosis, is it compensated, partially compensated, things like that. So commit these to memory and I'm going to go over them with you real fast. Okay, a normal blood pH is 7.35 to 7.45. A normal PaCO2, which it measures your carbon dioxide levels, is 35 to 45. And a normal bicarb, which is measured in HCO3, is 22 to 26. And you need to know which values are acidotic and which are alkalotic. So I have this little table to help you remember um, anything less than 7.35 in a pH is an acid, and anything greater than 7.45 is basic, alkalotic. Okay, for PaCO2, measuring your carbon dioxide levels, it's the opposite. The lower number, I mean the higher number, is actually acidotic. So anything greater than 45 is an acid, and anything greater than 30 or 35 is basic. Anything less than 35 is basic. And any for bicarb, anything less than 22 is an acid, and anything greater than 26 is a base. So it's alkalotic. Okay, so let's look at those causes of respiratory alkalosis. Okay, so we've establish that you're breathing too much, you're breathing way too fast, you're hyperventilating, you're having tachypnea. So let's remember the mnemonic tachypnea because that is a big cause for why you're having respiratory alkalosis. So each letter will correlate with a cause. Okay, so T. T stands for temperature increase in the body, aka fever. What happens is whenever you have a fever, this is increasing the metabolic needs of your body. And to compensate for that, your lungs, your respiratory center, tries to increase the respiratory rate. So what you're going to be doing while you have a fever, you're going to be hyperventilating, you're going to be breathing way too fast, and you're going to be getting rid of that carbon dioxide. So that can cause it a fever. A for aspirin toxicity, remember this, this a lot of tests like to ask about this, they may give you a scenario about a patient who ingested a whole bottle of aspirin and what condition are they at risk for. So remember this and why this causes respiratory alkalosis is because whenever um, you have too much aspirin on board in the body, it causes the body to go in hyperventilation mode because it simulates that respiratory center in your brain, the medulla and the pons, to breathe faster. It also causes a fever, which we just learned that fever causes respiratory alkalosis. It causes a lot of bad things to the body. It also increases your potassium or decreases your potassium levels and makes you go into metabolic acidosis. So that can cause respiratory alkalosis. Um, C for controlled me mechanical ventilation. Patients who are intubated are definitely at risk for respiratory alkalosis. Remember this. This is another test question that um, NCLEX and professors like to hit on. They'll say that the patient um, has these following blood gases and the blood gases will be respiratory alkalotic blood gases. And they'll say which patient below would you expect to maybe ha be at risk for having these type of blood gases. So remember this, um, the reason that these patients are at risk for this is because um, they have a machine that's controlling how much they're breathing, how much um, controls the rate of their breathing, and what can happen is that you can hyperventilate the patient and cause them to take in too much oxygen and deplete too much o CO2. So you're hyperventilating them, you have a fast respiratory rate, so you really have to monitor these patients. Um, H for hyperventilation, which is the whole basis for this. Um, this is where, just where you have the excessive respirations and you're expelling the CO2, so just hyperventilating can cause it. Um, y for hysteria, the H, I mean the Y in hysteria, this is where you have anxiety, a patient's going into an anxiety attack. One of the hallmark signs of an anxiety attack is that they start just hyperventilating and they're getting very worked up. and Again, this leads to the rapid breathing, they have the hyperventilation, and they're just expelling all that CO2, so that's going to throw off their levels. Pain, P for pain. Um, whenever a patient's in pain, they're hurting, they're breathing fast, they have increased, increased respiratory rate, so again, you're expelling the CO2. A pregnancy can cause this, especially if a woman is in the third trimester of pregnancy because you have the fetus that has moved up, it's up underneath that diaphragm, 
um, the respiratory tract has changed in the way that it's settled because you have this fetus up there and that can lead to respiratory alkalosis and pneumonia. Okay, N for neurological injuries. Any injuries to the head that hurts the respiratory center, again, the medulla or the pons area, like with a head injury or a stroke can cause the patient to go into respiratory alkalosis. Um, e for embolism and, and edema in the lungs. And then A for asthma due to hyperventilation because whenever a patient has an asthma attack, they are hyperventilating sometimes and this can cause them to blow off too much CO2. Okay, so now let's talk about how these patients are going to look, what you're going to do for the patient as the nurse, and then let's work a arterial blood gas problem with a patient in respiratory alkalosis. Okay, so how are these patients going to look to you as the nurse whenever they're in respiratory alkalosis? Okay, one of the most classic signs, if you can't remember any of the other signs and symptoms, is this. The patient is going to have a very fast respiratory rate. They are going to really just be breathing in and out hard. Um, a rate greater than 20, but sometimes you're going to see it up in the 40s, just really hyperventilating. This, in turn, is going to cause them to be confused. They're going to be tired for breathing that fast. Their heart rate's also going to be increased because, I mean, they're really using some energy. So their heart rate's going to be high. Now, other signs and symptoms that you really, really want to remember are these the following um tetany any ekg changes uh, muscle cramps and positive chavotsky sign does chavotsky's ring a bell remember in the fluid and electrolyte series where we're talking about calcium whenever you have low calcium levels you can have tetany muscle cramps and the positive chavotsky sign that's where you stimulate the masseter muscle at the jawline, tap that, and either the nose will twitch or the lips will twitch if the calcium level is low. And whenever you have respiratory alkalosis, this affects your calcium and potassium levels and it decreases them. So they will exhibit signs if they're really bad alkalotic of hypocalcemia and hypokalemia. Now remember, in respiratory acidosis, it actually increased the potassium levels. So remember that because a lot of test questions like to hit on that. So in alkalosis, it decreases calcium and potassium levels. But in acidosis, it increases your potassium level. Okay, so what are you gonna do for this patient who is in respiratory alkalosis? Okay, you wanna teach them breathing techniques. If they're having an anxiety attack, something like that, you wanna have them slow their breathing down, hold their breath, get that breathing to slow down, or rebreathing in the paper bag. That helps them whenever they're blowing off that CO2 to inhale that CO2 again, hopefully to get those levels back up. Watch the potassium and calcium levels and for those signs and symptoms, of low potassium and calcium levels. And also, um, remember this, this is a big one. If the patient is on mechanical ventilation, because remember that was a cause of respiratory alkalosis, make sure that the settings are appropriate and they're not hyperventilating. So you'll wanna watch out for that. Now let's solve a arterial blood gas problem that many professors on your exam and on the NCLEX will ask you to solve. They'll give you the scenario of these blood gases and say, which of the following is the patient in? And is it compensated, fully compensated, or not compensated? Okay, so I like to, whenever I solve any blood gas problems, to use the tic-tac-toe method. I have a video, the car, a card should be popping up or a link in the description below, where I actually I have two videos where I work the tic-tac-toe method with you, show you how to set up the problem and everything like that. So be sure to check out that video because this really makes it easy solving blood gases. Okay, so first thing we want to do is we want to look at our readings and we set up our tic-tac-toe. Remember as a child, we would set this up, do our lines and you're going to label one column acid, the middle column normal, and the next column base, which is for alkalotic conditions. Okay, so we're gonna look at the PaCO2 and it says it's 25. So we remember back from our memorization of our chart that a normal PaCO2 level is 35 to 45. So this is not normal, they're 25. So we know that they are alkalotics because anything less than 35 is alkalotic. So we're gonna put PaCO2 over here under our basic. Okay, next, 
pH 7.5. We know that a normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Anything greater than 7.45 is basic. So our pH is basic. And we have tic-tac-toe right here. So we know that we are dealing with respiratory alkalosis. And that's one thing with these ABG problems. You don't know if you're dealing with metabolic or respiratory, respiratory issues. So the tic-tac-toe method helps you because when you get a tic-tac-toe, you know that whatever your issue is is the one that you have a tic-tac-toe with. So we have respiratory alkalosis. Now we need to decide if this is compensated, partially compensated, or not compensated. So we're going to look at our bicarb. Now remember at the beginning of the lecture, I talked about the kidneys will excrete the bicarb to get to help bring that pH level down. So we're going to look at the bicarb level to see if this is what the body's trying to do to compensate. Because if the bicarb level is messed up, then the body's trying to compensate. So our bicarb level is 17. A normal bicarb level is 22 to 26. So it's not normal. So the body is trying to compensate. And anything less than 22 is acidotic. So our HCO3 is acidotic. So the body is trying to compensate. But is it fully compensated or is it partially compensated? Now this is where you're going to look back at your pH. Now the whole reason that the kidneys is excreting all that bicarb is to help bring this pH back down to normal because it's really high. So we look at our pH. Our pH it's still abnormal, so it hasn't fully compensated yet. So this would be respiratory alkalosis partially compensated. It would be fully compensated if our pH was normal, but it's not. Okay, so that is a little bit about respiratory alkalosis. Now be sure to go to my website, registernursrn.com, and take the free quiz to test your knowledge on respiratory alkalosis and acidosis. And be sure to check out my other teaching tutorials. And thank you so much for watching, and please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.